Hey, it's Mike here, and today I wanted to share my reaction to the recent super long video which featured director of Game Changers James Wilkes on Joe Rogan debating Chris Kresser, who had debunked his documentary just about a week or so earlier. And I responded to that debunk. I will link the video in the description as well, if you haven't seen it. Because the debate was nearly four hours long, I know you don't want me to cover the whole thing. We're just gonna look at a few of the highlights. We're gonna reinforce some of James Wilkes's arguments by cracking open some of the studies they were talking about. And we're also gonna talk about forest plots. If you saw it, you know that was definitely one of the more memorable moments of the whole thing. You know how do you read a forest plot? <laughs> yes or no? So we're gonna look at how to read those step by step. So it's gonna get a little bit sciencey in a bit, but we'll make it easy to follow. And finally, I'm gonna explain why I am pleasantly surprised with Joe Rogan here. All right, let's go. So to start, the first hour was a bit rocky for James, as he told me himself. You know, he was still getting in the groove. It was it was a bit of that two versus one, two people who eat meat against the vegan, which is pretty standard. But there's one point there that just didn't get enough attention, didn't have enough time that really bothered me a lot, and that was when James pointed to Chris's slide where he actually actually quoted himself and then underneath it linked to the study that he was talking about. And James was like, hey, that's kind of messed up. And they were all like, oh, don't worry about it. Come on, you're just nitpicking. When you put something in quotes, what does that mean to you? Th that quotation is quoting the study, right? Fair enough. Is that what they said in the study? No, that's not what they said in the study. Mm, that was right. my uh, summary of the evidence of the study. In right, the study. thank you. But when you put something in quote, that's misleading. But that's his quote. Okay, fine. Anything you do in literature, when you put something in quotation marks, you're quoting the study. But that, uh, let's just let's just bypass that. We're going to crack open the dairy and cancer meta-analysis he was quoting there, but just from an academic perspective, this is very much unacceptable. It is absolutely misleading and makes it seem that what you were saying was actually a direct quote from the study. Now for the actual study, which was a meta-analysis of meta-analyses, which said that 71% of the studies did not find an association between cancer and dairy. 13% actually showed a decreased risk of cancer with dairy, but 16% showed an increased risk. And so what Chris did was he clumped the decreased and the no risk together to make it look like 84% were against dairy causing cancer. So Joe and Chris both argued that this is a good case that dairy doesn't cause cancer because there would have been an association and more, but James sort of clapped back by saying a lot of the studies there were industry funded, and I will say I just randomly went down and clicked on one, and it was funded by the National Dairy Council. I don't know the exact proportion of all of them. What you'd have to do is you'd have to crack open each one of those meta-analyses, and then you'd have to see which portion is industry funded to really know. Anyway, James also mentioned that within that meta-analysis of other studies, you can see that prostate cancer studies were about half in favor of dairy being associated with prostate cancer. And just so uh, in this meta-analysis that you point to, the highest connection that they could find between dairy and any type of cancer was prostate cancer. Prostate cancer was, a, that's disturbing. So it's 50-50 with yeah. dairy consumption. Isn't that a, a high risk for males? Prostate cancer, yeah. yep. it's, it's a high one. Joe actually responded by saying that this was worrisome and it is super worrisome, especially when you consider that a portion of those are industry funded. And it's cancer by cancer, also endometrial cancer, a female reproductive cancer. They only looked at one meta-analysis, but it showed an association between dairy consumption and endometrial cancer. So 100% of the studies in that case supported the causation. Supports causation, doesn't prove causation, wanted to be clear on that, but the idea is that a good portion of the studies on both of these two cancers make a strong case for that cancer and dairy connection. And this is really important because when you're looking at something like cigarettes, cigarettes don't cause all cancers, they cause lung cancer. In addition, processed meat causes colorectal cancer. You don't have to cause all cancers to be cancer causing. So if dairy just causes prostate cancer in the end, it still causes cancer. You know, you're not gonna be like, oh, plutonium doesn't cause toe cancer. It just doesn't cause cancer then. No, that's not how it works. But then as we got into the second and third hour, something amazing happened. Joe started agreeing that James Wilkes was winning these points. Yeah, amazing, I think it's really amazing important. points. Yeah. Chris, this has not been that good for your arguments. I think he's made some good points. James sequentially then builds a case that Chris is not fully qualified to be the go-to nutrition guy, especially for such a large audience. In addition to, in certain cases, very likely misleading people with his statements. Chris did not debunk the film. 
He made misrepresentations of our claims and he got things factually wrong. One example of a point that James won, even according to Joe Rogan, was on B12. His initial movie claim was that even farm animals are given B12 supplements to get their B12 levels up. And the reality is when Chris said that that was not true, he was just wrong. Well, he certainly seems to have gotten it factually wrong that animals, particularly cows, are not given B12 supplements. He certainly seems to have gotten it factually wrong that at least some of the B12 that people would be able to get in the past right. they got from water and soil. And that 40% of to people fact. are uh, Division B12 and that the best way to get B12 is the supplement. From, uh, and this is for a newer study from 2018 with twice the sample size uh, of the ones. And they, you know, people now know you should take a B12 supplement. The studied markers indicate a generally sufficient cobalamin status independently of the diet preferences, lacto over vegetarian or vegan. Now this is a study that looked at runners in May of 2019, really current. This is comparing vegans, vegetarians, and omnivores. And all, these are runners? Yeah, and-, and Recreational athletes, runners. Recreational runners, yeah. All three groups showed an adequate biomarker status of B12-related parameters. And how do you think I'm doing so far? Well, with B12, it was a home run, for sure. Another topic that they really went deep into was protein, and this was probably the most complicated section. If you're really interested, I think it's a clip that you can just watch from Joe Rogan's Clips channel. But James did a really good job because Chris, of course, is coming at the angle of, oh, plant protein's inferior. These scores for protein are higher in animal products. But when talking about plant versus animal protein and protein scores, James kills it. And to be clear, what you're about to hear is Joe reading from the studies that James put forward. It just came out last month, published by Stanford. So yeah. I get that you haven't seen right. it. The more precise data collected so far in humans assessing real specific oral ileal nitrogen digestibility has shown that the differences in, di in the digestibility between plant and animal protein sources are only a few percent contrary to historical findings in rats or determinations using less precise methods in humans. Now, I'll take this one step further. There's only at most like two or three percent different in digestibility of plant protein. And you know how it's assessed in the pigs? They give them raw food. So they give raw beans, raw grains, and you have said one of the reasons that it's less di uh, digestible is because of trypsin inhibitors. Yeah. What and happens when that, and what well, happens when you cook? You would definitely break them down. <laughs> if you heated it, that you would get s uh, equivalent. You might even get more. In the Western world, which we're talking about, when you're getting enough protein, it doesn't matter. You're still able to absorb the amino acids that you need in the amounts that you need. I just want to point a point about the amount that we're actually requiring. Okay, we're going into the amount now. We're still, we're in, um, yeah, we're in amount for athletes. Cause, yes. Cause his point is like, maybe you can get enough to survive, but not to be an athlete. Again, you don't agree with the consensus of science. Protein so, supplementation beyond a total daily protein intake of about yeah. 1.6 grams, kilograms a day during RET. That's resi uh, resistance exercise training. Training provided no further benefit on gains in muscle mass or strength. Looking at about three quarters of a gram per pound recommended. Anything over that provided no gains. Yeah, in other words, based off how much you absorb, you can easily hit those essential amino acids with plant proteins. And when you're eating a ton of those animal proteins past that, you're really just eating them for no reason. And this is where I just have to make a comment about Joe Rogan because I've made a ton of videos on this channel picking apart things that Joe Rogan has said, you know, responding to them with science. And I still think he was wrong about all those points, but I am very impressed with how he was able to see the more solid information that was against his initial bias and change his perspective. So he blew my mind and I will say it probably helped that James Wilkes was coming from a UFC background. He even made an analogy at one point about like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu versus other types of martial arts. And like that certainly landed super well with Joe. And I think that helped him win him over. All right, this is where things got a little meme-ish. This is where they started talking about forest plots in terms of this one heme iron and cardiovascular disease risk meta-analysis. There's a point where James Wilkes was straight up like, do you know how to read a forest plot? And Chris Kresser was like, no, I don't. <laughs> it was not a good look. You know how do you read a forest plot? <laughs> yes or no? I don't. What does that mean? Chris's claim was from a study saying that actually the heme iron and cardiovascular disease risk was really mainly limited to the US and other countries didn't really see this association. The heme iron is only associated with 
poor outcomes in the U.S. It's not. In That's other, actually not true. It's not. It's, it's actually not, not true. In, in other actually, countries. Actually, and we're going to talk more about that study. But in that meta analysis, they had a forest plot. And so now everybody feels like they need to know how to read a forest plot. So as somebody who has done masters in public health level statistics and research methods and the fact that this isn't that complicated of a subject, I feel comfortable giving you a quick forest plot reading lesson. All right, here's a super clear forest plot. These are often used in a meta-analysis, which looks at several studies to compare the results directly in one place. So on the left, we have the study authors delineating the study. We have a scale on the bottom, which in this case is odds ratio. Since these are dummy studies, let's say that it is the odds of getting lung cancer in people who smoke occasionally versus those who don't, where 2.0 would be twice the odds or 200%. And smokers versus non-smokers in reality have 15 to 30 times the risk of lung cancer. So that's why I, just to make it more realistic, I said occasional smokers. The baseline or vertical black line at 1.0 would be people who don't smoke and their odds is simply one or 100%. That's the comparison. Now the average or mean value of each study is represented by a square and the size of the square is actually the population size of each study. For example, in the Smith et al. study, we have an odds ratio of 1.3. The center of the square lines up with that. If you trace it down to the scale at the bottom. Okay, now to those horizontal lines connected to each square, which is the part that James was challenging Chris on knowing the meaning of or not. That is the confidence interval. Most commonly, you'll see a 95% confidence interval, meaning that the researchers were 95% confident that the true result is within this range, this confidence interval. And that range is also represented in the parentheses after the odds ratio value in the column on the right. So the lower end of Smith's confidence interval, for example, is 0.5 and the higher end is 2.6. And huge point about confidence intervals, if they include one, that means that they are not statistically significantly different. The researchers are not confident that the true value actually varies from the comparison from the baseline from one. With the example of smoking occasionally, you wouldn't be confident from that Smith study alone that it increases the odds of cancer. Obviously, we know otherwise though. And for examples of studies that didn't overlap with one, the NG, I don't know what that is, NG, and CHU studies here don't have a confidence interval that overlaps with the comparison or baseline. So there's statistically significant findings. And that makes sense because the square size representing population is bigger, which means they had more data, more statistical power, which would give a more clear answer. Finally, we have that summary measure, which is a white diamond that represents the average of all of the studies. Now, an easy to miss point here is that the confidence interval is actually represented by the left and right corners of the diamond. So other forest plots like this one might have a wider confidence interval in that final result and therefore an elongated diamond. And like in this forest plot, sometimes that diamond will even overlap with one, making the final meta-analysis finding not statistically significantly different from the baseline. And for example, we would hope that a study on fresh mountain air and lung cancer would yield this type of result not statistically significant. All right, now that you know the basics of forest plots, let's open up that study that James and Chris were talking about, which was this one on heme iron and cardiovascular disease. And here is the quote. The Heme iron is only associated with poor outcomes in the U.S. It's not. In That's other, actually not true. It's not. It's, it's actually not, not true. In, in it's other actually, countries. Actually, James had a good response, which was that actually this claim of the study isn't really that accurate. Here in the high versus low intake comparison forest plot are all of the non-U.S. studies highlighted that found a statistically significant result. These include the Netherlands, Japan, and Sweden. And as you can see, to make it more clear, a forest plot can also have a square population size in gray and a more precise black point for their average value. And yes, that white diamond at the bottom does not overlap with one, therefore it's statistically significant, which led the authors to conclude, quote, higher intake of dietary heme iron is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, whereas no association was found between cardiovascular disease and non-heme iron intake or total iron intake, non-heme, of course, being plant iron said that heme iron was associated with cardiovascular disease. That was a conclusion of the study which he didn't put up on the screen. And while there may be a mechanism for heme causing cardiovascular disease, my best guess here 
is that heme iron is just a marker for animal fat consumption, which we know, you know, that saturated fat increases LDL, which is causally linked to atherosclerosis, to cardiovascular disease. Now there's an equally strong case that heme iron is no bueno even outside the US. And there was a point where they were all kind of agreeing that the negative effects of heme iron can be buffered by these plant antioxidants. For example, it can be buffered by chlorophyll. But Chris's argument that meat is not unhealthy based off this is kind of logically ridiculous. It kind of harkens back to those people like your relatives that say, oh, I just I just love to drink red wine because of all that resveratrol, all of those antioxidants. And then they just go even harder. <laughs> Hey bro, you know that if you drink a lot of water right after you snort some cocaine, it's actually less unhealthy for you. Hey Chad, bro, let's let's hit the yacht now, come on. But you can't just rely on how super healthy plants are to offset the actual negative damaging effect of an animal product. And those heme iron chlorophyll studies were done in animals. Clearly, heme iron has negative effects. Now the last point I wanna to touch on is something that happened quite quickly and I haven't heard anybody really talk about at all. And that's the point where Chris says it took several emails for him to sort of reluctantly come on and actually debunk the game changers on his show. Now whether that's true or not, it, it could be really telling. First of all, it's the idea that Joe Rogan kind of created this whole scenario. His bias against a vegan diet had him reach out to his go-to anti-vegan to then go and debunk this film to, you know, reinforce his own beliefs. But the end result was a bunch of Joe Rogan's preconceptions actually being shattered, which was pretty great to see. And I would also add that I, at points I felt kind of bad for Cresser because he was just reamed so hard by James Wilkes over and over again, even though it was a point where, where James was just talking to Joe about Chris in third person, about, <laughs> about how unqualified he was. But at the same time, Chris spent hours attacking what James had spent the last seven or so years of his life on, his like life's work. But the main point here is that, well, I will say that Chris was guilty of misconstruing some things. He was really just delivering what Joe ordered. Joe asked him to find a rabbit in the clouds and he delivered a rabbit in the clouds. Of course, after all of this, we're yet to see if Joe Rogan has any intention at all to even change his diet, which is interesting because James Wilkes actually told Plant Based News a while back that he thought that Joe Rogan would go vegan after seeing the Game Changers just based off what he focuses on. But that didn't happen, obviously, so who knows? There's there's still time. Okay, really quickly, I just wanna mention that my favorite vegan jacket company's cutoff for Christmas delivery is December 16th. And for example, I am going to order one of these sweet vests for one of my family members because they liked them. And I also wanna mention that the second panel, which is on crop deaths, which featured Seb, Alex, Tofu Goddess, and a primatologist named Nick Lyston is now live on Mike the Vegan 2. I'll link that below as well. All right, thanks for watching. Feel free to like and subscribe as usual. Hit that notification bell extra hard, and I'll see you in the next video. Sorry.